Okay, so I, Johan, I will give a short introduction and then we can kick off with your slides and talk. <laughs> sure. Okay, so welcome everyone to our last Teo seminar um, before the big conference in June. So today we welcome Johan Pansu with the talk Investigating High Resolution Interaction Networks in African Savannas for Understanding Ecosystem Functioning. So before we start, um, for the ones who don't know me or the society, so my name is Anna-Marie Woods, and today I will moderate this session. Um, the Society for Tropical Ecology is one of the oldest societies in the field of tropical ecology in Europe. And we um, offer annual international conferences. The next one will be end of June in Jeske Wojciewice. And we also have a journal called Ecotropica, which is open access and peer reviewed. Um, we also offer grants and awards, such as travel grants to the conference, research grants, or also the Marian Award is giving to the three best posters and the best talk. We also have a tropical ecology early career group where we meet once a month and we discuss um, things like challenges in field work or the publication process. We also have speakers that we invite to, for example, discuss how to apply for a postdoc or how does the habilitation process look like? So if you want to be part of the early career group, you can send me an email, contact me via Twitter or Facebook. And um, we also offer a free trial for one year um, so you can try it out. <laughs> okay, so a short overview of uh, what is TEO, Tropical Ecology Online Seminar. So as said before, this is the last TEO seminar because we go back to normal with um, in-person meetings. And um, with this TEO seminar, we wanted to offer like a platform in particular for early career researchers. So we combine usually a presentation of an established researcher with, a, or one, uh, with one or two presentations by early career researchers. Today, Maximilian is unfortunately sick. So we will have um, the pleasure to host Johan um, with his talk and we have a discussion in the end. Okay, so Shortly, I want to present Johan. <laughs> so he's a researcher at the Institute of Evolutionary Science in Montpellier. And no, actually, not anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> Correct me, please. <laughs> uh, no, I'm lecturer now at the uh, University of Lyon. Okay. But I hope the rest is correct. So you focus on community and disturbance ecology. Yeah. And, you <laughs> and you specialize in the development and application of environmental DNA approaches and these approaches you apply to trophic ecology of large herbivores, ecological restoration, and coastal ecosystem management. And I saw that you're mm -hmm. currently leading a Marie Curie project for developing new tools based on environmental DNA methods, especially for so, managing coastal environments, correct? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's, the, the grant is finished now, so I moved to the project, but yeah, okay. I'm still working. Um, I moved to a uh, more uh, ecosystem ecology, mm -hmm. so still applying the same tools and okay. same um, same approaches and research fields, but to uh, aquatic ecosystems. Okay, interesting. So we're happy to hear more about your research. I will <laughs> give you now the the stage. So feel free to share your screen. You should be able to. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, so yeah, as I just said, I moved recently to Lyon University. Um, so I'm working now more on the uh, ecosystem environment, but the my talk today will be on African savanna and how to investigate, uh, well, how we can use our resolution interaction networks to understand ecosystem and community functioning. So the, well, the underlying question getting this work was how can we explain that so many large herbivores can coexist in African savanna? So as you can see on the map on your right. Um, oh, we can't see at yeah. your screen. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought bad. you were giving an introduction without slides. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, my bad. Sorry for not telling uh, you earlier. Okay. Um, so it was working. Huh. All right. Yes, okay. now. Perfect. 
So yeah, I was saying, how can we? So the idea is was the you know, the underlying um, question of this work was to understand the mechanism that could explain that so many large herbivores can coexist in African savanna. So as you can see on this map, we in Eastern and Southern Africa, um, more than well, close to 12 species and even sometimes 30 locally, uh, large herbivore species can coexist. Uh, by herbivore species, I mean uh, large uh, mammals over five kilos, roughly. And so, of course, there is one pretty well-known mechanism, which is um, re niche and resource partitioning. And but when we talk about niche and resource partitioning as a well as a mechanism for supporting species coexistence, we can talk about many things. So um, the first one that has been widely described is the partitioning in habitat use. So. Um, as you can see on the map of, on, on your right, um, it represents the occurrence probability of different species. So as you can see, some, some of them sometimes don't overlap at all. And so we can have um, special partitioning of habitat, but also temporal partitioning. So species that can occupy the same habitat, but one with it today and another during the night. Um, another kind of partitioning is in the use of different plant functional groups and the so-called grazer browser continuum. So typically in, in, um, in the literature, large herbivores have been classified as either grazer or browsers. So, and some species as that feed both on grass and rose um, where classified as mixed feeders, such as elephant or impala. Um, well, some other uh, mechanism were described as the partitioning in the type of tissue consumed, like steam versus leaf versus flower, or even partitioning in, um, in, the, in the height of, um, of consumption. So between a small antelope and a large antelope, they can feed on the same plant, but at different height. But so far, there were no really taxonomically explicit mechanism. And by this, I mean, how the can species uh, differentiate the food, the, the plant species they use actually. And so that was the main, um, that was the main question of my work uh, when, I, when I started working in this at Princeton University a few years ago. And so, yeah, there were some evidence that actually uh, large herbivores can uh, select different uh, food plants and differentiate the diet based on the plant species they consume. So, but the problem is that we have some difficulty to precisely identify and quantify the plant items uh, in large herbivore feces with traditional methods. Uh, of course, there is always the problem of comparing the methods, and um, the only spe the the first time this mechanism of uh, food plant species partitioning has been described, it has been done in only one site by Cadiz et al. in 2015, and so the idea of this work was to see if this um, partitioning at the plant species level was actually um, uh, a common mechanism. So we decided to, to set up a project at the continental scale to reconstruct our resolution trophic networks using fecal DNA metabarcoding. So the idea was to first collect the poop sample in the field, uh, sometime directly in the, into the animals. Uh, and uh, we amplified a small region of, uh, small genomic region that can give us inf uh, taxonomic information on the food uh, consumed by herbivores. So we apply this techniques to uh, 10 sites for Africa that represented roughly 4,000 samples, 30 species, and more than 150 populations in total. And so the idea was to reconstruct um, high resolution plant herbivore networks. And from this, we were able to assess several generalities uh, related to uh, larger herbivore ecology. So the first thing we, we did was to revisit the classification of herbivore feeding yields. So as I told you uh, before, 
were classically um, classified as Grazer browser or mixed feeders. And, uh, but in total, we were able to identify 123 families um, over the data set. Uh, but two of them actually uh, dominated, the Poasi and the Fabasi. And when we look at more closely at the relative abundance of plant families in populations diet, we actually realized that the dietary niche uh, of species often contrast with classical classification. So if you look at, for example, the buffalo or the war dog, or even the artibus, they are classically considered as uh, obligate grazers. But as you can see on this graph, the buffalo, for example, uh, sometimes eats very few grasses, and but it can hit many fabaces and also a lot of other things. And so this actually uh, show more um, light on the plastic, um, the plasticity of the trophic niche of uh, most herbivores. The, the second thing we assessed was the core of our work was to check if food plant partitioning is a common mechanism in African savanna. So on these ordinations, each dot represents uh, an individual diet and uh, the ellipse represents the, the population wide uh, diet. And so the closer the points, the more similar is the is the diet of individuals. And as you can see, there are often very few overlap uh, in the in species diet. This is, for example, in Yasa here on the bottom left uh, corner, um, you can see that there are very few overlap between species. And so this uh, proved us that food plant partitioning is a common mechanism in African savanna. So we, show, we observe that in most of our, uh, of our sampling season and sampling sites. And this led to the conclusion that we actually have a cryptic niche differentiation. And by cryptic, I mean that is very hard to identify. So, uh, I mean, with classical methods. So now with this eDNA methods, we are able to actually uh, shed lights onto this fine scale mechanism of uh, species coexistence. Um, and this, uh, this cryptic niche differentiation is also observable between ecologically and phylogenetically close species. So on the left-hand side, you have the dietary differentiation between uh, St. Patrick species of uh, gravy zebra and plain zebra. And as you can see, the, di the diet of the two species that live in the same environment don't overlap at all. And we have another example on the right with the um, warthog and the bush pig in South Africa. So <clears throat> overall, uh, we, then we assess the proportion of significant diet differentiation between pairs of species. And we, ask, uh, we observe that in 97% of cases, the, the dieter, the, there were significant uh, differentiation in diet between co-occurring species. But when we look at more closely at the strengths of diet differentiation, we observe that one side, actually here, the, the blue one in the middle on the, on the bottom panel, the, Gor the Gorongosa National Park was an exception. And if we look at just the grazers in this part, the partitioning looked like this. So what we, what we concluded is that in that part, the, um, the resource partitioning was uh, much less uh, st uh, structured than in other part. And the interesting thing that we'll dig up a little bit more later is that this park, contrary to others, is uh, actually, uh, currently under restoration. So it experienced a dramatic decrease in a large herbivore uh, population during the civil war between 1977 and 1992. Uh, and virtually there were no herbivores during that time. And, uh, and then the population started to recover uh, in, the, in 2010, so a little bit before. And so this community is highly dynamic. And we suspect that uh, 
this uh, this pattern actually reflects the the this this uh, dynamic recovery of population. But I will talk about that later. So overall, the that the we conclude from this from this study that the the cryptic data niche differentiation is a common mechanism promoting coexistence in large herbivore communities but the intensity can be variable from one side to another and then we we were wondering what are the what are actually this, the factors structuring this um this food plant partitioning so we actually assessed three different hypotheses the first one was that food plant species partitioning was driven by species traits. The second one was that the strength of food plant species partitioning is modulated by the intensity of the competition. And so we expected to typically observe a reduced uh, niche partitioning in less competitive environment. And also that predation could play a role, a role in, the, in the strengths of this um, of this uh, partitioning. So we actually tested the first hypothesis that food plant partitioning um, was driven by species traits. And so from this, uh, we extracted the, uh, a quote from Dan Jensen in 1977, where he say that herbivores do not hit Latin binomials. And that is true. But however, they are able to, uh, to select the food and they do that based on plant traits. So we assess this, uh, this hypothesis um, by combining a fecal DNA metabarcoding uh, to reconstruct uh, herbivore diets with, uh, um, with data about 27 functional traits from for more than 200 plant species in the Gorongo National Park. And so we try to correlate the diet of all species here represented by the, by the dots and squares and triangles uh, with, the, um, with the plant traits of, uh, of, this, uh, of this plant species. And so what we observe is that the first axis on this origination was directly related to uh, the grass uh, the, the relative abundance of grass in the species diet. And so actually this first axis uh, is related to several traits such as leaf sickness or emicellulose that um, differentiate grasses from udicotyledons. Um, and the second axis here um, is related to several traits such as the nutritive value of the diet and other traits that can be related to um, actually the herbivore body mass such as tensile, uh, tensile strains or, um, uh, or height of the, or the height of the, of the plant species. And so we have actually we can we can basically understand this uh, these figures uh, as uh, so what we conclude from that is that the the herbivores can identify traits differentiating grass from odicotyledons, leaf sickness, and cereal content, but also other traits that are related to nutritive value or the plant size. And so actually this is in line with the German Bell hypothesis showing that uh, the lower herbivores eat more food, but of lower quality. And so um, that's the, that was the main conclusion of that. And then uh, using a more broader data set, we, um, we, ha we, we had the, this hypothesis that Monocotyledons are phylogenetically and functionally less diverse than agicotyledons. And so this should offer less scope for uh, grazing, uh, grazing species to partition their uh, the diet. And we observe, we observe that at the community level, where we correlated the graziness of the community, which is basically the mean uh, grass uh, relative abundance in all the, the diets sampled in, in, a, in a given area uh, versus the, the dietary niche overlap index. And so what we observe is that 
the more grazer in the community, uh, the higher is the, the dietary niche overlap in that community. And so that can actually be explained by the fact that monocotyledons uh, offer less scope for uh, partitioning. And so if there are many grazers that feed on monocotyledons, we observe a high dietary niche overlap. And so that has also some implication on the plant network structure and uh, especially uh, the modularity and the nestedness. So the modularity is actually the, the structure of the, is how modular is the network. So do we observe um, species uh, of herbivores that feed on a specific set of, um, of resource or uh, is there a more, uh, or do they have more generalized diets? And also the nestedness, which is uh, which represent the fact that some um, some diets are actually um, nested within the diet of other. And so, what we observe is that the network modularity was uh, negatively correlated with the graziness of the community, uh, while the ne the um, the nestedness. Uh, increase with the graziness of that community. But um, so what we what I wanted to to illustrate here is that actually this um, this traits that can be uh, identified by the by the species uh, have an impact directly on the dietary niche overlap but also on the global um, network structure. Then to assess the second, um, the second hypothesis, which was that the strains of partitioning was modulated by competition. Um, we use a, a global data set uh, from, um, we use our global data set from uh, our continent-wide analysis. And we try to find the best model that could explain dietary differentiation between species. And what we observe is that the best model will actually include differences in body mass between species. So here, the, um, the, the, the higher was the, the difference in body mass, the higher was the differentiation in diet between species. And also uh, this model include the rainfall, which is in our case, a proxy for competition. And basically uh, what we observe is that the higher the rainfall, the more resource we have, so we have a, a reduced uh, strength of dietary niche overlap in, uh, in this environment. So that confirm our hypothesis that the um, resource niche partitioning was reduced in less competitive environments. Um, and now I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the Gurungash National Park um, in Mozambique that I told you earlier was uh, an outlier in our data set. So um, as I mentioned, the, um, this park experienced a dramatic decrease of large herbivores during the civil war. And as you can see on this graph, the, the, um, the relative uh, density of mega herbivores versus mesoherbivore totally shifted uh, between the, between the pre-war pre -war period and now and today. So before the war, we had um, the mega herbivores such as elephant, hippos, and buffalo dominated in terms of biomass. But now that the community uh, has reached uh, roughly a pre-war level in terms of biomass, you can see that mesoherbivores dominate. And so by mesoherbivores, I mean, it's often uh, mid-sized ungulates such as uh, antelope, mostly antelopes. Uh, in addition to that, um, the community totally shifted and um, the 70% of the herbivore biomass is actually uh, this single species of antelope, which is called the water buck. And of course, as there were very few herbivores for a long period, we have also, uh, we have still, uh, we had uh, low predation pressure and the carnivore population at the time of the study was actually very low. So there were no, 
no jackals, no hyenas, no leopards, and the lion population represented uh, roughly one third of what, what it used to be. So we are in a system uh, that um, is characterized by low predation pressure and an asymmetry in large herbivore population recovery. And so we, we had two hypotheses when, uh, for this park specifically, one at the population level. So we expected the, to observe a high interspecific competition in the most abundant species. And so this high intraspecific intra competition should um, force the individuals to differentiate their resource use uh from their conspecific to actually uh, escape this intraspecific competition and so what we we expected to observe was a higher inter-individual diet viability in most abundant species and at the community level uh, this should translate to an important dietary niche overlap with the trophic of the trophic niche of rarer species should be nested within those of the more abundant ones. And so we tested the, these two hypotheses in Gorongosa National Park. So we, evaluate, we, we assessed the level of inter-individual variation uh, against several factors. So on your right, on the graph on your right, you can see how the, um, the inter-individual data variation was related to the population density. Uh, and so we tested different factors, such as the population density. So we, we, we observed that it was positively correlated with the inter-individual variation. Uh, the diversity in habitat use, uh, so species that frequent different habitats should also exhibit uh, a higher inter-individual variation. The body size because species with uh, large uh, body size can have uh, um, can occupy different habitat use actually and so they, they, they have a broader home range so we are we expect them to potentially uh, have a uh, we expect this to have an effect on, uh, on the entire individual variation and the last one which is probably the less obvious is the model width so the, but this is, uh, can be understood by the fact that um, the muzzle width uh, allow species to be more or less selective. So um, species with a narrow muzzle, they can actually select um, a leaf or a, a stem of a plant alone, while species with a large uh, mouth, they can't be that selective. And so they always graze in bulk. And so we expect species with a, a narrow muzzle to, uh, to be more selective and therefore to exhibit a higher level of inter-individual variation. And so overall, the best model we observed was uh, to explain this uh, higher inter-individual variation was actually the model that include the model width and the population density. So using this, we actually validated our, our um, our hypothesis that uh, the inter-individual variation was more uh, important in abundant species. And at the community level, we observed a very important dietary niche overlap, as you can see on this graph, where uh, if you look at this, this network, you barely see no difference between grazers and browsers and mixed feeders, uh, because you know, well, as you can see, this network is uh, show almost no modularity. Uh, species seems to eat a little bit of everything. Uh, so this actually um, confirm how our hypothesis is that the strength of partitioning uh, in this environment uh, with, uh, well, sure, it reflects the fact that competition is driving the strength of partitioning. Um, just a small word about that species in the middle that almost each species is uh, feeding on, which is called Mimosa pigra. Uh, Mimosa pigra is one of the most invasive species in the world. And when before we started the, the study, uh, the managers of the of Gorongosa National Park were very concerned about the spreading of that species. 
since the since the um, the civil war, and uh, they wanted to to set up some management program to eliminate his uh, his expansion to the park. But actually, when we started doing this uh, analysis, this diet the dietary analysis of uh, well the, the analysis of herbivore diet, we observed that in the float plain in the middle of the park. Uh, most of most of the species were feeding on that species, and it was actually highly selected by most of them. And so, in some cases, um, as you can see on the right, the mimosa tigra uh, represented uh, more than fifty percent of uh, those individuals' diet, uh, and this pattern was consistent over years. So. We were uh, we were actually wondering if uh, the recovery of large herbivore uh, was not uh, could not help the could well, well sorry we were wondering if the recovery of large herbivore population could help to uh, limit the spread of this um, of this uh, of this species within the park. and so we evaluated different scenarios um, so the fact that herbivores don't have any effect of, uh, on mimosa pigra, the fact that they have a negative, global negative effect for consumption, but also the, 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 the hypothesis that they could have a negative effect uh, by consumption, but a positive effect through uh, seed dispersion in phases. So to assess all this hypothesis, we combine historical data with in situ experiments, so exclosure, exclosure plots, um, as you can see on the bottom uh, bottom right uh, picture, and the uh, high resolution diet re reconstruction of uh, herbivore diet. And so, what we observe in our uh, in our experiments was that the in our uh, sorry in our exclosure plots. Uh, was actually that globally the large herbivores were affecting traits related to growth, survival, reproduction, and recruitment of mimosa pigra. So um, panel A showed the relative change in height in height of mimosa pigra in control plots where herbivores were actually uh, feeding versus exclosure plots. Um, we also observe a major difference in canopy area. Uh, in the in the number of flowers per plant and in the number of fruits per plant. So basically, we all this experiment together, the diet data, this exclosure plot, um, validated the fact that this uh, the restoring large herbivore population um, could actually control uh, invas this uh, invasive species, and this was also confirmed by the trends. In, um, in the dynamics of large herbivore versus mimosa pigra population. So we can see that basically as the large herbivore population increased, the proportion of uh, sample quadrats with mimosa pigra was decreasing. And finally, I want to finish with the, another um, uh, with the last, uh, our last hypothesis uh, about the effect of uh, the predation pressure. And so in that case, we expected an indirect effect of the predation, um, which is characterized by the fact that actually Gorangusa at the time of this studies uh, was what we could call a landscape of fearlessness. So basically um, they were virtually, there were so few predators that, um, Herbivores could evolve freely, uh, even in risky habitats, because there were no predators, so no risk of uh, being eaten. And so our hypothesis there was that this low predation pressure um, can allow some individuals to extend their home range to more risky habitats, and that these risky habitats that are, are usually avoided by herbivores um, can experience an increased competition through the arrival of species that usually are not there. And so I want to illustrate that um, through the the case, through the example of the bushbuck, uh, which is this, uh, 
the species on the right. Um, so the bushbuck is, uh, is a species that often stay in closed canopy area. Um, and it's very, very, I mean, it's very rare that they, they go feeding or spend some time in open areas because they, can't, they cannot run fast and they actually rely on, uh, on hiding and running through, through the canopy to escape predators. But in Gorongosa, uh, we anecdotally observed originally that some of these, some of these guys were, um, were occupying uh, the flute plain, which is uh, an habitat with no tree. And that was very unusual. And uh, we assessed the hypothesis that this home range extension, so the habitat, the, the expansion of their home range to the, the, to the flood plain was a response to a relaxed predation pressure. So for this, we actually uh, put some colors, uh, GPS colors on few individuals and simulated the predation risk um, through speakers in the forest, the speakers that mimic the roaring of a leopard and some scent cue as well that we make the cat urine. And um, what we observed was um, the, the proportional use of tree cover uh, increase in, uh, significantly in presence of predators for uh, the individuals that occupy the floor plane. And so we, sh we actually validated the fact that this occupation of this newly invaded habitat was related to a low predation pressure. And in terms of diet and trophic networks, that actually uh, also lead to some changes in species uh, diet. So on this, uh, on this origination, we, have, we, we can distinguish two groups. One groups that actually uh, stay in blue that actually stay always in the flood plane and the other that uh, go during the days uh, during the day in the flood plane and you can we can see that the um, the first axis of this of this uh, of this ordination discriminate these two groups and so they actually don't feed on the same plants at all and the funny thing is that when we look at more closely uh, what the the individuals that uh, frequent the flood plain were eating, they were feeding on Mimosa pigra mostly. So the invasive species I I talked uh, before. And when we look at, we also use this data to assess the nutritive value of diets, and we observed that the digestible energy. And the digestible proteins, so that which are proxies for the nutritive value of diets, were actually much higher, much higher in individuals uh, frequenting the flood plain than those staying all day long in the woodland. And that also was reflected into the physical condition of individuals. So these guys who, who, who came into the flood plain to to feed. Uh, came to the floor plane to feed on some specific plants, especially a mimosa pigra. So they get more uh, more energetic food, and so they were globally in better physical in better physical condition. So to conclude uh, this uh, this part, um, I want to highlight three points. So first, that fecal DNA metabolic coding is a very powerful approach to reconstruct high resolution interaction networks in hyper, in hyper diverse tropical environments. The second one, that the flood plant species partitioning is a cryptic but common mechanism that can support a coexistence in large herbivore communities. And the third one, that the food plant species partitioning is driven by species traits and that this trend is modulated by both competition and the, pred the predation intensity. Uh, and I'm good for now. Uh, so unless uh, I know Max couldn't make it, so the, I have a few more slides if you want to talk more about other kind of ecological interactions, but that's up to you. Thank you for your attention.
Yeah, thank you, Johan. Um, that was very interesting. And I guess good news um, for the fight against invasive species, seeing that things can be restored. Um, yeah. So I welcome everyone to ask questions. You can raise your hand or post a question in the chat and we can start the discussion. Yeah. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Yeah, maybe then I go first, um, like linking to the um, the results about the invasive species that you said mm -hmm. um, was uh, controlled by the restoration of the large herbivores. And mm -hmm. then um, while the uh, the population of the large herbivores increased, the um, population of the invasive plant decreased. I was just mm -hmm. wondering, like, what happens then if this invasive plant is like so... Um, decreased or like gone like do they switch to another plant or does that mean now um this invasive species actually has a great value for the community uh, there um so yeah actually what what we could say so far is that it actually played an important role for uh supporting the the population increase uh in the first stage in the flower plant because this species is mostly found in the flower plain. Um, but actually this, um, their abundance and the, their um, repartition to the landscape is decreasing now. Uh, but, based, but originally they were not necessarily feeding on that species. So of okay. course they can, they have all the species I mentioned, they have a pretty much, a pretty much, uh, pretty, they can be flexible in the diet. And uh, the thing is that most of most of the species that are actually feeding on that plants are grazers mm -hmm. but this plants is a shrub so they are not mm. the it's they heat it because it's there and it it has a high uh, nutritive value but they, it's not a grass okay so they could they could actually feed on lots of other things and we actually i didn't uh i didn't um showed that that's i didn't present that study but um the but the but actually the flow plane is very saturated with uh with the water bike because water bike as its name as its name say uh lives in wetlands mostly and so it's mostly retrieving the flow plane so it Usually, don't uh, they don't go in the savanna in the wooded habitats, but the competition is so intense in the flood plain that the proportion of water buck living in the um, in the savanna is increasing now. Oh. So we have the other the opposite trend: the bushbuck are going into this <laughs> into the into the flood plain, and the water buck is going the other way in the savanna. Crazy. And do you also see like an um, an increase then of other um, like grass species while the invasive plant um, mimosa is um, decreasing? Like, have you plotted this against the? Um... No, we it's quite complicated to get. We don't have this data at the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite complicated to get some reliable uh, trends over uh, of yep. the entire community over the at the landscape scale. Yeah, it would be um, interesting to see if it can be restored the original plant community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, we know whether that one we did a small experiment on um, um, in the flood plain, uh, so uh, uh, around some plants that were actually eaten only by bushback, mm -hmm. and so we expect and we saw that they were actually feeding on those ones, and so we expect this. Uh, the the dynamics of this other species are are affecting are affected by this uh, by this uh, shift in mm -hmm. um, in uh, in population uh, in uh, individual home range. Okay, yeah, we have another question by Sotiria. Could this meta barcoding approach work for invertebrate communities with the same success? Yes. Yes, um, I'm sorry Max wasn't here today, but I think it was the topic of this talk, so, of his talk, so, or something <laughs> close to that. So, uh, we, uh, I haven't done it myself, but yes, yeah, several colleagues um, work on that, 
Uh, mm. uh, I'm thinking about uh, some colleagues in uh, in Austria, uh, and uh, and yeah, many many works on uh, many projects on uh, invertebrate diets are uh, are running currently. Um, I'm working with um, invertebrates also in Ecuador, and what the limitation here is is the um, yeah the data bank for invertebrates is um, I guess I mean from mm -hmm. our experience much um, the resolution is much lower than for example for plants um, mm -hmm. and that uh, um, yeah it's hard to go beyond um, family level often or you can just distinguish okay these are different species and so on mm -hmm. but not really. Um, say which species are they or yeah which genus even so i guess this is still a limitation with the i don't know if you also have um, problems with the resolution for some plant species um yes yes of course it's, uh, it's kind of a common problem um we are lucky enough for um for the for plants that we have this marker that is quite short so it can be easily amplified in degraded samples such as fecal mm -hmm. sample but can have pretty good resolution, but uh, we know that for some groups we have a lower resolution. So, for example, Poasi, we are not very resolute in that group mm -hmm. with this marker. But uh, mm -hmm. you can have some you, you can adopt some strategies with broad marker. That um, that's actually a strategy that can be that is often used for uh, for um, omnivore species. So having a marker that can amplify many uh, taxonomic groups mm -hmm. but with a low resolution so you have a kind of an idea of the proportion of each of these groups oh, yeah. the proportion of grass versus vertebrates versus uh, um, whatever fungi mm -hmm. and uh, and then you can use more um, more uh, tax more resolutive markers yeah. on within each group to to get more uh, taxonomic insights uh, about what is actually written. Okay, interesting. Yeah, we can talk a bit more about the process of meta barcoding later because here is another question. Did you check how your findings on niche and resource partitioning in wild herbivores would be influenced in the presence of domestic livestock or in a shared landscape? Yes, I didn't do it myself, but um, one of my co uh and actually the, the PI of the lab where I did this work in Princeton, the Princeton Uni, they worked a, a lot in the Mpala National Park in Kenya. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's not a national park, it's a, it's a reserve. Uh, and, uh, and this park actually hosts uh, a lot of livestock, domestic livestock. And the first study that actually used metabarcoding to assess uh, species, uh, to, to assess this food plant partitioning was conducted there. And it included um, cattle versus uh, buffalo and, uh, and I don't remember the other one. Uh, and another domestic species. So yes, and so, and they observed that um, that they this they, they were strong resource partitioning even between uh, cattle and buffalo, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I guess. Many and, that, and and I and I think we, and we've continued that. So if they continued that for a couple of years, and mm -hmm. yeah, they observed that systematically the domestic species were feeding were also. Um, occupying a different trophic niche than the mm -hmm. there are wild relatives. Okay, so this may shift a bit the trends. Of, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I guess many people joined the seminar because they are um, they want to maybe also use meta barcoding in the future. I was wondering if you could give like a short overview of the process, like the um, preservation of the samples. How much does it cost? How long does it take to to do meta barcoding, what are the risks mm -hmm. um, to preserve the DNA and so on? Yeah. How many hours do you have? <laughs> Maybe um, the most important, I don't know, five points when working with um, um, DNA samples. The, <laughs> yeah, I, um, of course, uh, I think the, well, just to give you an overview of the process, uh, it involved collecting sample in the field. Uh, avoiding cross-contamination 
because we are dealing with inflammatory DNA. So that's probably your worst enemy in the field. Um, you you don't want to, your sample to be contaminated by, by uh, simply, for example, by the by the wind, by dust, by the DNA that can be translocated by dust. So, for example, in this case, for fecal samples, we systematically collect only the inner part of the poop and avoiding the all the area that we're in contact with the soil, plants, or uh, um, and if we have if we had a uh, we we take always the inner pellets so mm -hmm. to avoid contamination. Um, for this for the storage, we can store them. Um, you can freeze them directly, or you have some um, some uh, buffer that where you can actually break the cell in the field and it's called some, some, something like a DNA shield uh, that can protect the DNA at room temperature. You can, so you can use that for transportation back to the lab. Um, then in the lab, you have many, there are plenty of uh, kits for, uh, for extracting DNA, uh, fecal DNA mm -hmm. even. And, um, so, and then you have to select your marker based on uh, your, uh, well, of your a priori knowledge of the diet of the species. If mm -hmm. you, if it's an herbivore, predator, uh, car carnivore, uh, an omnivore, whatever. Uh, but also think about the reliability of your, uh, of the reference database you can use. So in that case, uh, we combine, uh, we develop several, um, Refer local reference databases, but not always because it was such a huge task that we did that for a few sites. But, and we combine that with global uh, reference database that we could extract it from uh, uh, from BOLD or the NCBI. Uh, and, um, and then you, so you do a PCR to amplify your marker. So it's a, it's a DNA fragment that is taxonomically uh, informative, and you can sequence that on um, on a high throughput sequencing platform. Mm. Then you need to think about, uh, and then you have a lot of work still <laughs> for <laughs> for uh, for trimming the data. Uh, ah, before analyzing them, there is a lot of uh, work in the um, bioinformatic work um, mm. to treat the data. Luckily, now we have quite a lot of uh, of uh, of pipelines. Mm -hmm. Maybe too much, honestly, <laughs> because it's sometimes hard to follow the literature on that one. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, we, there are many tools that are existing. So I hope um, that uh, it will be developed. It's still developing, and I think it will keep going that way. So with trimming the data, you mean like there's some things that need to be picked out, like some um, DNA that... Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, because you, you need to, to treat your data because um, during the, the, the PCR process, during the sequencing process, some replication uh, errors can occur. And so you mm -hmm. have actually uh, erroneous sequence that are generated. And so you have noise sequences okay. that you need to, to deal with. Uh, to give you an idea, in a so it's quite often that um, in a park for, like Gorongosa, where you have where you know that you should have roughly 600 plant species at max, mm -hmm. uh, you can retrieve uh, tens of thousands sequence sequences, different sequences. Okay. So you need to be able wow. to decipher between the true sequencing and the wrong one. Okay. So okay. there are many ways to do that. Many, many tools are existing, but that's actually uh, a big challenge. Mm -hmm. And so some people are trying to, and so there is also a trend to trying to develop um, PCR free approaches. So to avoid this kind of issue and also avoid the problem of uh, pre-field amplification because primers sometimes uh, amplify better some groups than others, some species mm -hmm. than others. And, um, and so, yeah. It's, there is a lot of technical development still. Okay. Yeah, Michelle, did you have a question? 
Yes, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Jan, for this uh, great uh, presentation. Um, linking two different uh, uh, themes that are very important for tropical ecology. I mean, metal balconing on one side and network analysis on, on the other side. Uh, that was very interesting, in, uh, especially one of your or two of your slides about uh, uh, the trait of plants in relation mm -hmm. to the body size of the animals. And, and I have a, a kind of uh, uh, a question, which is more personal question to you, is what do you think about the importance of acacia in, a, in the diet of kudu? You know, there's a big uh, idea that uh, acacia is uh, developing some uh, 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 compound, compound to avoid the predation by kudu. Mm -hmm. And this has never been really tested. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that kudu are eating a lot of acacia seeds, uh, mm -hmm. leaves, sorry. And uh, I look at your picture and uh, kudu uh, seems to be really in one extreme of the uh, of the gradient of, uh, mm -hmm. of the trend. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how much of uh, their diet depends on acacia in your study, uh, according to different sites and, mm -hmm. and whether and with us, there's a lot of variation in diet of kudu across the different sites. Yes. Um, can you allow me to share the, the screen again? Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, well. Should, should work. <laughs> You're still co host. <laughs> okay. Um, so, this one. Um, so, kudu specifically is here. And this is the proportion of fabaci. So I guess yeah, yes. fabaci. So as you can see that uh, the percentage of fabaci uh, range between uh, almost zero to forty percent, depending of the depending on the location and season. And uh, kudu is actually uh, is one of the species that eats most of other families. So the Basically, the so this pattern when I say when I say that poaci and fabaci were dominate uh, dominate the diet of all species uh, was not entirely true. Um, they are they are quite frequent, but uh, they of all the Tragelaphus genus uh, were actually uh, feeding on other type of uh, shrubs or trees, not necessarily yeah, so, fabaci. Yeah, so this is very interesting. Uh... Result, I think globally it's very important, but for this case, it's really important because there's, there was there's still a big discussion about the importance of uh, acacia for kudu and how it is uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how it's, it's affecting the, the survival. And you mm -hmm. show here that really acacia is a, an extreme case uh, for kudu and they should not eat acacia at all, in fact, or eat a little. Well, I think it depends also of the. Um, I mean, there, there were there, there are there are definitely acacias in um, in uh, in Gorongosa, but some of them are very tall trees, so trees that cannot be reached by the. Okay. By the well, by kudu, uh, so I yes. think it depends on the vegetation structure. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing that is that um, in the study about the traits. Uh, we unfortunately we did not uh, account for um, for chemical defenses, so that's something that still need to be investigated. Oh yeah, I think there's a lot of discussion to have on this topic. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Hope You're to welcome. see you soon. Yes, me too. Are there any more questions from the audience? <laughs> seems not like it. I just have one final question. Um, yeah. It was very interesting to see this increase in um, uh, speci specialization with um, body mass, right? I'm sorry, with um, uh, with dietary, um, dietary um, differentiation with body mass, what you showed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So it, yeah, the idea was to say that species with different body mass should have mm -hmm. uh, more different should have a, a larger uh, more different diet than species okay. with a lower difference in body mass okay do you think this could be transferred um also to non-mammals like um invertebrates uh, do you expect that just like a hypothetical question 
yeah, because we we observe that in all of our sites, so uh, it's quite a common. I, at least in large herbivores, it's a common pattern. Mm -hmm. so why not? <laughs> of, yeah, it would be in of course, it's 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 kind of uh, it's kind of expected just because larger species uh, occupy uh, more broader uh, 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 more broader home range, and they also mm -hmm. have access to more resources. Mm -hmm. so it's not. It's also kind of uh, related to it's related to their ecology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for invertebrates, I don't know. I mean, there's also different body traits that may play a role in. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Should you compare, should you compare mm -hmm. flying species, non flying mm -hmm. species? Probably not, but uh, species yeah. with similar traits, uh, mm -hmm. with similar, uh, in a similar habitat, um, occupying right. uh, with similar uh, traits, you can expect to observe. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could expect to observe this better. It would be interesting to look at this in the future because I guess um, many invertebrates mm -hmm. are very important um, um, herbivores there too in this system and contribute probably also a lot to the um, mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> the the grazing and so on. Yeah, thank you, Johan. Um, You're very welcome. Yeah, and to to join us for the last Teo talk, um, I will quickly share my screen to make some final announcements. So there was already the question about um, where this recording will be published. So we we have a YouTube channel, so you will find the um, video within yeah a week on our YouTube channel. You can also find the link on our website, and we will talk to Max if he um, would like to record his talk. Um, yeah, post to this conference, and then we can also share it on YouTube. And so the next big event is our conference um, of tropical ecology in Jessica Budjovice in Czech Republic. So the theme is here, many species, many challenges at the end of June. And you can already submit your abstract. Um, we have already the early bird registration is open until the 5th of April. And we have some special prizes also for society members. So become a member. <laughs> And also the special thing about this conference is that um, yeah, conference, dinner and other social activities are included in the registration fee. So this said, um, we hope to see many of you at the conference in uh, Czech Republic. Katarina Sam, who is also here, is uh, the organizer, the main organizer of this event. So we're all excited um, to go there. Yes. So thank you, Johan. And yeah, I close this. Um, Theo seminar for today yeah. and um, was a great ending of this um, nice um, talk series. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks. Yeah, guys. you too. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everyone.